Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, and we are happy to start uh, our first seminar in uh, the fall semester uh, in our ATMP series. And today we are happy to have Alex Buchel, and uh, he will speak about black holes on the conical with fluxes. So please start. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dmitry. So it's uh, uh, my real pleasure uh, to speak. So uh, as I was mentioning before, I uh, graduated from uh, um, Fistier in 1994. But uh, unfortunately, this talk is going to be in English because it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit challenging for me to speak in Russian. Uh, so, so I'm gonna. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna uh, mention right away. Um, it's it's a very technical talk, and uh, um, I would. It's it's a challenge for me. So I will try to uh, to convey ideas, uh, and I would strongly encourage you to interrupt me at any time so that uh, um, uh, that I can answer the question. I don't want you. Uh, I don't want you to be lost. Uh, so. Uh, so this black holes on the conifer with fluxes, it has a, a very long history going, uh, going to early work by uh, Arkady Zaitling and collaborators. Uh, and even before that, um, so as, uh, as I will briefly review, Conifold was um, one of the, and, and still probably one of the very few Calabiaus, non-compact Calabiaus on which we know exact metrics. So it has, uh, it has an importance in string theory. Uh, so so uh, what I'm going to talk about is mostly those two papers, um, and I just, as I said, I will try to convey your idea uh, what is going on. Um, so there are several ways how you can uh, talk about um, the importance of conifold in string theory. Um, so it's important for the idea of uh, um, constructing this data vacua and landscape. Uh, however, uh, I will mostly be concerned uh, with applications uh, towards uh, gauge gravity correspondence. And so what I will start, I will start by, um, uh, by highlighting what I think one of, the, um, uh, one of the most dramatic outcomes uh, of the gauge gravity correspondence. And that's uh, in, in my view, and that's the idea that um, you can geometrize um, various phase transitions uh, in, uh, um, uh, in gauge series. Uh, so after that, I will go into a very long uh, review. So I will uh, set up, uh, set up uh, what is cascading gauge theory, how does it arise in uh, string theory. And I will be talking about what's known as a top-down holography. So all, all the models, uh, the models that I will discuss uh, will be a real string theory. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, from the quantum field theory part. I will talk, uh, I will explain what's cascading gauge theory. And in particular, I will lead you through the steps, how this cascading gauge theory arises in holography as an uh, exact holographic duality, um, basically following from, uh, uh, from the famous um, uh, ADS5, uh, process five, um, and equal four duality. Uh, and then uh, I will actually go to the meat of my talk, uh, which is basically I'm going to be uh, I'm going to pick a couple um, couple figures from uh, from my paper, and I will explain uh, what is going on. Uh, I might have to uh, skip various things, but um, in studying black holes uh, on the conifold, um, uh, we we can discover some very amazing uh, some very amazing phenomena. And that's the idea of the uh, exotic um, exotic phases, uh, and and so so if I um, if I have to sacrifice um, uh, something, uh, I will sacrifice everything. But I wanna uh, I wanna uh, give you this idea what it is and uh, uh, where it arises. So that's that's quite unusual, and then I will conclude with open questions. Okay, so I was told that I have to devote 60% of my time to, uh, to reviews. Uh, so let me start with review. Uh, so I will assume that uh, you have heard about ADS-CFT correspondence. And so one way how you can think of it is that uh, you can take, um, it's basically a duality between uh, open strings and closed strings. So you can take uh, a large number uh, of grains and 
um, these three brains, uh, put it in uh, flat uh, 10 dimensional uh, space time, R9, comma 1. Uh, and then um, you study at weak coupling, what is the effective action, uh, what is the low energy effective action of strings. And so in the open string sector, what you will do, you will identify uh, what's known as maximally uh, supersymmetric um, uh, SUN young mill theory. So this is a low energy theory of fluctuating strings uh, joining, uh, joining these three brains. And so the control parameter uh, in, uh, uh, in this geometry is a product of uh, a number of D brains and the string coupling. And so you have a picture as a gauge theory uh, when, uh, uh, when this product also known as a hoofed coupling uh, is much less than one. And now once you start cranking the coupling, uh, what will happen is that the solitonic objects, D3 brain uh, start back reacting on the geometry. Uh, and, 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 then, um, and then the physics is best described by a closed string sector. And those are the weakly coupled uh, closed strings um, that live in ADS5 cross S5. So are there any questions about uh, this introduction? Right. Uh, good. Um, so, uh, so uh, what I just described is, if you think, is just the uh, vacuum structure of the theory. Uh, however, uh, ADS uh, CFT correspondence allows you to study um, uh, to study uh, various aspects uh, of the duality. And so, in particular, what we can do, uh, we can study thermal states uh, of this um, young mill theory. Uh, so imagine that you have this unequal four super young mill theory, and what we're going to put, we're going to put it on the uh, three sphere, right? And so the three sphere will have um, a radius L3. Uh, so, so I will introduce and I will consistently use through the talk um, the compactification scale of the three sphere, this parameter mu. And so now the model has uh, two parameters, right? So I have uh, uh, a supersymmetric young mill theory. It's actually a conformal theory. Um, however, here I have two scales um, in, um, in the problem where we are asking the questions, what are the possible uh, thermal states um, of uh, the theory? So one scale is the temperature and the other one is this uh, compactification scale. Uh, so it turns out that um, that in this model, uh, there are two distinct uh, phases, uh, one uh, which uh, um, in famous Witten paper uh, was introduced as a confined phase and the other one is as a deconfined phase. Uh, so there are several ways or several, if you wish, order parameters uh, that uh, we can uh, um, distinguish those two phases. Uh, from, from the purely gravity perspective, probably the, um, uh, the sharp, um, one of the sharpest distinctions and uh, most easy to understand is the way if you look at, uh, um, at the entropy densities. Uh, so if, um, if you are in a deconfined phase, um, the, the entropy density will scale as a number of uh, um, uh, gluons and quarks and whatever the, their super partners uh, in your gauge theory. And so basically you get uh, n squared scaling um, uh, of the entropy density. And then uh, when you in a confined scale, uh, when you are in a, a confined phase, uh, the entropy density will be of order one. So it's going to be n to the zeros power. Uh, and, and, and so that's, that's a, a very sharp distinction. Uh, so, uh, so this model, uh, the phase transition is very well understood. Uh, and uh, so uh, depending on parameters in your model, uh, one phase is preferred compared to the other. Uh, so, so you can use as a parameter the ratio of temperature to the compactification scale, or probably a better way is the energy density above the extremality. Energy density. Um, and so, so over here is the idea is that as you increase energy density over the extremality, um, then, uh, um, uh, then the preferred phase is going to be a deconfined phase. So is the picture of the confinement, deconfinement, is this something to review that, uh, um, are there any questions here? 
it's going to be helpful if I hear something, some, some answer, because I don't know if I'm talking into a black hole. Well, it's, it's clear. Okay, okay, very good, very good. All right, so, uh, so as I said, that holography geometrizes uh, these transitions. Uh, and um, and so, uh, so there are uh, two ways how you can think about this confining uh, and deconfining phases in the geometry. Uh, so remember that the background, uh, well, I will uh, write it down a little bit later, is actually ADS-5. And when we talk about global ADS-5, uh, so there is uh, a three sphere, uh, and, then, um, and then on top of it, there is a radial coordinate, uh, R+, uh, and then there, is, um, then there is a time direction. So when we talk about, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, thermal states, uh, so it's best uh, to think in terms of the Euclidean time direction, right? So we are doing a Euclidean rotation. And uh, when we discuss thermal states, this Euclidean time, um, uh, time direction is compactified uh, with, uh, uh, with a periodicity uh, being inverse temperature. Uh, and, and so when I will be drawing uh, this nice picture, so when you see S1, uh, this is actually S1 corresponding uh, to the Euclidean time direction in the geometry. Uh, and, and, uh, and the green uh, as uh, the green phase, um, so this um, S3, uh, that's a spatial, uh, 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 that's a spatial S3 in the geometry. Uh, and so, uh, so when uh, we look for a solution uh, corresponding to two different phases of the theory, uh, then you can construct two topologically distinct uh, solutions. The first one is where geometry is uh, um, uh, geodesically completes itself uh, with a three sphere uh, shrinking to a zero size. Okay, so that's that's one topology, and so this is uh, uh, this is uh, a confined phase, and the reason why it is a confined phase is that if you were to compute uh, uh, the uh, energy density, free energy density, or the entropy density, you will find out that they all scale as uh, uh, n to the zeroth power. Uh, on the other hand, a topologically distinct uh, geometry is when uh, your Euclidean time direction, this S1, uh, shrinks, uh, shrinks to zero size. Okay. And so this confinement, deconfinement phase transition on the uh, field theory side, uh, it, actually, uh, it actually translates uh, into uh, what's known as a Hawking page transition. And that was pointed out in some early papers on holography by Ed Wheaton. All right, so, so what I'm gonna do in this talk, uh, I'm gonna, if you wish, study similar transitions, similar uh, different topological phases uh, in string theory uh, in, in a slightly more sophisticated theory. This is the so-called klebanov zetling uh, klebanov strassle uh, gauge theory. Uh, and uh, so I wanna highlight uh, what are the differences between this theory and the N equal four supersymmetric and mill theory. Well, um, so, uh, uh, so I just mentioned to you that N equal four supersymmetric Young Mill theory confines uh, on S3. Uh, however, uh, N equal four does not confine, uh, does not confine um, uh, on R3 comma one, okay? And so, so one simple reason, uh, heuristic reason to understand why this is happening is that uh, the theory starts being, um, uh, the theory is conformal. And, and when you have a theory on R3 comma one, there is only one scale temperature. And so that's, that's actually the reason that um, you can pretty much guess um, how the um, thermodynamic uh, quantities in this theory, how they, will, uh, how they will be scaling. So I am scaling uh, the entropy density, the energy density, um, and uh, um, the free energy is going to be minus n squared uh, t to the fourth. Okay, just purely based on uh, uh, dimensional analysis and the fact that the theory is conformal and temperature is the only scale. So, so, so n equal four super young mills cannot confine in R three comma one. And so this interesting, this interesting klebanov zetling klebanov strassler gauge theory, this is a series that actually confine in Minkowski space-time. So it turns out that at low energies, uh, the theory is uh, pure Young-Mills. Uh, so it, uh, um, it's actually a supersymmetric Young-Mills theory. Um, 
and and it has uh, so that's one of the reasons why we know that it would have to confine. Uh, and uh, the other interesting aspect of this theory is that um, uh, uh, because of the supersymmetry, uh, there is a U one R symmetry. Uh, and uh, it um, just, again, from uh, field theoretical arguments, uh, you know that this uh, U1 uh, symmetry, U1R symmetry, must be spontaneously broken um, uh, uh, when the theory uh, confines. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and so you can analyze uh, this model and find out that in this case, this U1R symmetry has to be broken uh, to a Z2. Good. So, uh, uh, so, so, uh, what does it buy us when we study black holes on the conic form? Well, uh, we can actually uh, we can actually ask very interesting questions. Uh, so, what's the relation between confinement deconfinement uh, and chiral symmetry breaking? Um, and uh, in particular, how how those two phase transitions happen at finite temperature, as is the same transition. So as I will mention later, uh, what we can do, we can uh, do some really cool stuff. We can, for example, put this um, uh, uh, model uh, in the expanding universe. And then we can ask the questions, how is confinement and chiral symmetry breaking occurs uh, in, uh, uh, in the city, um, uh, in the city space times. Okay. Uh, so, so, um, uh, so in uh, uh, in the n equal four case, uh, there is only one uh, uh, there is only one uh, deconfined phase, uh, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, so so that's that's what it is. So it turns out uh, it turns out that on the carnival there are five uh, there are five distinct uh, um, uh, distinct uh, uh, thermal phases. Um, and so what I did, I did like the purpose of this talk is to explain this phase transit, the phases and transitions between them. Um, so unfortunately it's a lie uh, because I will not be able to do it. So I, I will try to give you a play where why there are, uh, why there are all these, um, lots of this phase transition. Um, but uh, it's just, it's just a, a visual representation for you that the model we're gonna discuss is, uh, um, much more technical and uh, somewhat more complicated. Okay, very good. Uh, so are there any questions? And uh, if not, what I will do, I will uh, uh, go ahead and build for you um, uh, the holographic correspondence between uh, um, uh, string, you know, on, on one side, there will be this cascading gauge theory, on the other side, this will be the uh, conifold model um, in string theory. So any questions before I start? So okay, I wanted to ask uh, yeah. concerning these pictures. So, uh, like, uh, what's the meaning of this upward direction? Like, even in the simplest example that you showed. For oh, example. you you mean uh, you mean say uh, say this direction, right? Yes. Okay, that's actually very good. So I really appreciate you guys if you ask me questions. I, I like otherwise, you know, just just don't don't get lost. There is you know there is no need. You you should have fun. So this, uh, this direction is actually a radial direction in holography, okay? And so what you see here, so if I focus on this picture, so I didn't explain what this is, but this is some five-dimensional manifold, uh, five-dimensional uh, manifold, and it's compact, right? So, you know, in the previous example, this what would be a five sphere, and the picture, uh, this uh, vertical picture, what it shows you, you, it shows you that you start with some size of this, say, five sphere or some compact manifold. And as you go along the radial direction in your 10 dimensional supergravity, the size of that, um, of that uh, manifold changes, but it never shrinks to zero size, okay? So once you reach uh, very deep there, if you wish the center of the space, you can still identify uh, how big uh, how big was um, that manifold. So in the case of the uh, ADS5 uh, cross S5 holography, as you know, the five sphere does not change at all as you go along the radial direction. So for the S5, the correct picture would be that the size uh, stays unchanged, okay? Uh, and and so so um, so what, what's important when I'm drawing this picture is that I identify that there is some cycle, there is some submanifold in your full geometry that actually shrinks to zero size. Okay, so as I go 
as they go along the radial direction, it becomes smaller and smaller, and then it shrinks to the point. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, but I also like, is there any, uh, like what's the physical quantity that corresponds to R on the boundary side? Like- uh, Right, so, so, uh, so so uh, um, so that tells me is that uh, I should have reviewed maybe a little bit more idea CFT correspondent. So so this um, radial coordinate. No, I mean, like, why is related to like phase transitions? No, it does not relate to phase transitions. So so this radial coordinate R, uh, it corresponds to um, what it corresponds to. It corresponds to um, the energy scale in your boundary field theory. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, so what is happening? Uh, what is happening is that um, uh, if you uh, take R goes to infinity, right? Uh, so, uh, so this was done in one of the early papers on ADS-CFT correspondence. What is happening in that case? You are approaching the ultraviolet uh, of your theory, uh, and. Uh, um, so 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 um, uh, so this is this is this cartoon picture is that uh, as you as you go uh, to high energies right so as energy goes um, to infinity from the boundary perspective uh, then uh, you increase the warping of the background uh, geometry. Alex, uh, uh, yeah. maybe this was not actually the question. Maybe it would be easier. Once you get to the equations, it will be easier to see where is R, et cetera. Where, okay, okay, yes. okay. But I actually, okay. another, maybe you could comment on the earlier stuff when you talked about Hawking page transition, because you'll be talking about black hole. So uh, you, you actually, yeah, so one way to see this is to consider, say, a gas of strings in ADS, in global ADS, at high right. temperature, and then you lower the temperature, you get a black hole inside ADS. So that was a weakness picture, right? So that's, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that because that would be, I guess, important for you. Um, so why black holes? That's, 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 that's a common question, yeah. Right, so, so uh, good. Uh, so this, this actually takes me a little bit, uh, a little bit off uh, uh, of the topic of my talk, but what Arkady is alluding to, and this is something that uh, those of you who are following the archive, so there is this resurgence of interest uh, between the, um, which is known as polchinski horowitz model, or the correspondence between, uh, uh, between strings uh, um, and, and black holes. So how do we know how exactly in a string theory, how does, uh, how does sort of the black hole arises? And this is something that Arkady was alluding to. And so the idea is that uh, you can imagine that uh, uh, much like we can talk about um, um, uh, gases at finite temperature, you can think of uh, that you have a gas of strings uh, at, uh, um, at some temperature. Uh, so so, so uh, when you have a vibrating string, so vibrating string has a huge, uh, huge density of states at high, uh, at high energies. Uh, and so for that reason, there is a so-called terminal temperature. There is a Hagedorn temperature. And in that case, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the vibrating string, if you allow it to self-interact, uh, it will be almost indistinguishable uh, from, you know, from the black hole. And, and so, so in particular, right now, what is happening is that there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, resurgence of interest, exactly how this transition between the thermal, uh, uh, the thermal um, um, gas of strings uh, occurs towards the black hole. As I said, this is not exactly relevant to what I am talking about because the transitions that I am talking about, they will be the so-called first order phase transitions. Yeah, but actually- so those, I those would be the kind of transitions uh, as you see between- uh, Alex, Alex, I didn't, uh, indeed, I didn't have in mind this, what you just said, Okay. okay. All, I, all, I'm having, all I had in mind is that you can consider global ADS with compact time. Right. And compare it to black hole inside ADS. That's what I had in mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's, you mean, uh, you mean that one has a, um, you know, uh, entropy for the n squared, the other yes. one does not. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'll, uh, I'll mention this a little bit later. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get to this.
um, I'm moving a little bit slow. Uh, so, uh, right. So let me go ahead and explain to you a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, more details uh, um, uh, what the holography is in this n equal four. I will spend maybe a little bit more time over here, uh, and uh, um, and then skip uh, and then skip to um, uh, to actually the meat. Okay. Um, so what I was asked, I was asked uh, uh, where is actually uh, where is actually the radial coordinate, and so um, uh, um, so what uh, um, uh, what I wrote, I wrote the um, the basic correspondence between n equal four um, S U N super Young Mill theory on one side, uh, and and then A D S five cross S five geometry. Uh, so you see that. Uh, uh, when I write down the 10 dimensional metrics, there is a metric for the uh, ADS5, um, and then there is metric for the five sphere. Uh, and uh, uh, as we were discussing regarding the uh, topology and uh, um, topology changing transition, what happens is that uh, the radius of the five sphere does not run, uh, does not run uh, with R or energy, okay? Um, and, uh, and and so the, the, uh, this um, uh, this part of the geometry, as I said, is a metric on ADS5. So I guess it's a good point now uh, to uh, say, to just highlight what Arkady was talking about. Uh, so, so, so this background, uh, so besides um, in this holography, besides uh, the geometry, what you also have, you also have uh, a five form flux. Um, and, and so, um, uh, so when you compute uh, the integral of the five form um, over the five sphere um, and you normalize it properly, um, you get the number N and this number N is exactly related uh, to the rank um, of the gauge group that we have. So that's the second parameter. And the last parameter is the relation between uh, the dilaton or the string coupling and the Young-Mills coupling. Okay, so I basically reminded you uh, what the dictionary is. So, so now let me, um, let me mention these two phases, how those two phases would look like. Um, so so, um, uh, so the, uh, the confined phase, right? So confined uh, phase. So the confined phase would correspond, uh, remember that the first thing you need to do, we would need to analytically continue um, the time direction, right? So that will turn it into a plus sign. Uh, and then uh, the second step, what we would need to do, we would need to periodically identify, uh, we would need to periodically identify uh, this Euclidean time direction uh, with uh, uh, period one over T, and that is uh, your S1. This is your S1 uh, on this picture. And so when we construct two geometries, there can be two topologically distinct solutions. So, uh, uh, so there can be, um, um, okay, so, the, the thing is that I ran ahead of myself and what is happening is over here, um, I have to write down, actually, um, in this case, there is, you cannot see this transition. Um, so so let, me, let me actually go ahead and write it down. Maybe go back here. Right, so, um, so when I write down the metric in this case, so this is gonna be the metric on global ADS5, right? So this is gonna be uh, quash squared rule Euclidean time direction squared plus uh, sinh squared rule times uh, the three sphere squared plus gyro squared. Okay, so, so what I wrote for you, I wrote for you the metric corresponding um, to this confined phase. And so what you see, uh, you see that there is a three sphere over here. Uh, and then there is, uh, there is a uh, S1. So remember this Euclidean time direction um, uh, is compactified. And so this is a so-called global ADS. 
and that's a, a confined phase, the phase that will describe, you know, basically uh, thermal strings uh, in global ADS. And you can see that this radial coordinate, so I called it R, but in this picture it's four. So it goes from, um, it goes from zero to plus infinity. Well, okay, so maybe better write it down from plus infinity uh, to zero, right? So this is an infinity. And then uh, as, uh, as rho approaches to zero, the three sphere uh, shrinks to zero size, right? So you see this hyperbolic, um, hyperbolic sink. So that's uh, that's one um, that's one solution uh, um, to the equations of motion, and then there is another solution, the solution corresponding to this different phase, right? So once again, I can put the uh, radial coordinate r, and I can write down the metric in this case uh, ds uh, five squared. So that's uh, going to be one plus uh, r squared. So so let me write it down maybe like this, so I'm gonna write it down F times uh, DT squared plus DR squared over F plus R squared times um, DS3 squared, okay? Um, and, and so there is this non-trivial function F, and so this non-trivial function F is one, uh, one plus R squared minus R plus squared uh, and over here I have uh, um, over R squared, uh, one plus uh, um, R plus squared. Okay, so there is some non-trivial function. And so what is happening is that uh, solving the equations of motion corresponding to this phase, my radial coordinate now changes from plus infinity and it doesn't quite reach zero, right? So it reaches a plus. And when you plug down in this metric function f, when you plug r equals r plus, you will find out that f uh, is equal to zero. And that's exactly the point uh, where the warp factor in front of the uh, uh, dt, uh, dt component of the metric shrinks to zero size, right? So this sorry, is r uh, equals r plus. Uh, yeah. Maybe I ask, uh, maybe a stupid question. Uh, so we start uh, with the same phase then uh, we tend R to infinity energy increases, but why we end with two different phases? Well, see, the thing is that uh, you do not, so, so your picture suggests that there is a, um, um, that there is some sort of continuous, uh, continuous phase transitions, it's not. So what I uh, mentioned briefly is that uh, this is an example of the phase transition, which is a first order phase transition. So, so this is a phase transition that on the field theory side uh, proceeds through the bubble nucleation. So it's not um, the phase transitions you have in mind are sort of uh, transitions where there are some instabilities that develop. And uh, um, that, that's usually what, uh, what the picture of say uh, uh, mean field uh, second order phase transition. So, 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 so the story so it's here- So different ways uh, how we uh, uh, limit F to infinity. Well, so, 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 uh, so, so the best way to think about it is to, uh, no, radial coordinate is just, you know, a way to parameterize the metric. So that's, that's not essential, right? So I can choose a different coordinate. I can have the same, you know, uh, the same, uh, um, the same spam of radial coordinates. That's, that's, that's not the issue. So the best way probably to think in terms of the transition between ice and water, okay? As you know, you can have uh, uh, superheated ice or supercooled water, right? So you can have water at a little bit lower temperature and you have, uh, you have ice at uh, a little bit higher temperature. Um, and and so, so, so what this means is this means that if I'm close to a transition, right? But you know, on one side or on the other, there can exist two phases, right? And as uh, water and ice, they are not continuously connected phases, right? So at least, you know, in this gauge theory, large and gauge theory, those two phases are not continuously connected. And the reason that they are not continuously connected, there will be two distinct topologies, two distinct uh, backgrounds uh, for strings that will describe those two phases, right? And so, so, um, so what I highlighted you, I highlighted you how the topology, how the uh, background geometry will differ 
Um, if we have, for example, over here, you can think of that we have ice and over here we have water. Uh, and and so, so as you know, uh, in, in, in this standard physics picture, when you have a first order phase transition between ice and water, you always know which phase is dominant, right? So all you have to do is just, you can compute pressure and the phase that has a higher pressure at the fixed temperature will be a dominant one, okay? Now, uh, that's exactly the same thing that happens uh, in, in this idea in string theory uh, with phase transitions. So you have two geometries. For each of these two geometries, you can compute the free energy, which you can think of as negative pressure. And then the dominant phase uh, in, in, a, in a case of first order phase transition is going to be the phase where you have lower free energy or the higher pressure. So the, the analogy between phase transitions, um, what you know in statistical mechanics or thermal physics directly extends to, to these ideas of black holes and topological transitions in black holes. What, what is cute here, what I find so exciting is that, um, you know, these different, different phases, what you see in your field theory, what you see in, uh, you know, in gauge theory, represented by different topological backgrounds in, uh, um, in string theory. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, good. All right, so, um, so now, I will not have time to explain to you guys pretty much anything. So, so let me just uh, let me just highlight, uh, just go pictures only, right? So, um, so and explain what is going on. Uh, so, why why it so happened? Why it so happens that when we look at this more complicated background, why there are more phases? Okay. Uh, and, and so once again, uh, in in all these pictures uh, that you see over here. Uh, so the vertical direction is the radial direction and it starts from infinity and it, you can think of it goes to zero or it goes to whatever point it is where one of the cycles uh, shrinks to zero size. Now remember that we're doing a constructions in 10 dimensions, right? And so in 10 dimensions, what we will do, we will subtract this radial, uh, uh, radial coordinate, right? So I, show, I told you that the radial coordinate is the one that goes upwards. So minus one uh, for radial, co uh, radial direction. And then what you are left, you are left with uh, nine dimensions, right? And so these nine dimensions are going to be compact. Uh, compact uh, dimensions, okay? Uh, and so every face, every picture that you see here, uh, that's a picture that has this uh, nine dimensions. So in the first picture, what I have, I have the so-called uh, T11 manifold. So this T11 manifold is uh, something that when we start talking about this klebanov strassler theory, that will replace the five sphere. Okay, so this is um, this your T11 manifold. Uh, and then um, as we discussed extensively um, in the context of um, um, N equal four super young males, uh, there is a, a spatial S3, right? So our theory is on a uh, three-dimensional sphere. And then this is our Euclidean time direction, right? So this is S1. And so what you see, you see is that there is one phase. And so this is the phase where the spatial three sphere shrinks to zero size, right? So this in fact is very similar to the way how the confining phase in N equal four on S3 arises, okay? Now it turns out that uh, this manifold, right? So I need to tell you a little bit about symmetries. Uh, so, so, uh, in N equal four holography, we have a five sphere. And this five sphere has, um, has um, SO6, uh, SO6 R symmetry, okay? Uh, and, and so this is, this is really, as a group, this isomorphic uh, to SU4, uh, and, and that's the extended symmetry of N equal four super young males. 
Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is that this one of these compact manifolds, it encodes the um, uh, R symmetry of the series. And so it turns out that this uh, T11 manifold, it has a U1, uh, which is a chiral symmetry in the gauge series. Uh, and, and so in this phase, so this is a phase in which this chiral symmetry is unbroken because what you see, you see this T11, uh, um, uh, T11 space, that's that Saturn coset space. Uh, so now when we move to a different phase, okay, so this is, um, uh, this is, oh, well, let me say, this is a different confined phase, right? So in this phase, uh, you can see that I still have in total nine, um, nine dimensions, right? So this is three, uh, three, this is two dimensional sphere, another three dimensional sphere, and then there is a, a circle, right? So which is five plus four, nine. So, so, so what happens is that this phase describes, um, uh, this, this topology describes a phase in which the U1 symmetry is broken to Z2. So that's a spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry. And it turns out that this T11, this what used to be this coset space, T11 manifold is actually, um, is actually um, uh, best thing topologically as uh, some non-trivial vibration of uh, S2 and S3. Uh, and, uh, and, and so one of the phases, so this is a different confined phase. What, what is happening is that there is a, some sub-manifold uh, which is inside T11 that shrinks to zero size, right? So this is this yellow phase. And that's a topologically distinct, uh, topologically distinct phase. Right, topologically, so it's a different phase in your gauge series, and it's a different. Uh, this is a different solution of string theory. So now uh, we can move. Uh, we can move to this picture. Uh, and and so what you see in this picture, this is yet another picture, right? So this is a picture um, uh, where um, a spatial S three shrinks to zero size, right? So this is. Um, Again, a confined phase. The reason why those uh, three um, uh, three objects they correspond to confining phase is because the uh, Euclidean time direction never shrinks to zero size, right? So this is S one. So I have um, if I have to classify in this more complicated uh, theory um, gauge theory due to dual to conifold, there are actually three distinct confined phases, right? So in the case of the, um, uh, of the N equal four, there was a single, there was a single uh, um, confined phase. So think of this is from the perspective of thermal physics, as if you have uh, three different type of ices, right? Three different, there is ice with different crystalline structure or something like that. Um, and, and, and so what is happening and something that uh, is discussed in my paper is what are the phase transitions, which phase is the dominant one and how the transition occurs between those, uh, uh, those, those all these three, their deconfined phases. And finally, uh, there are these uh, two other phases, right? And so those are the confined phases. The reason why they're confined phases because you see what is happening is that this Euclidean time direction, it shrinks to zero size, okay? So whenever you have a Euclidean time direction that shrinks to zero size, this is just a um, black hole solution uh, in your um, supergravity background. And what you did, you took this black hole solution and you um, analytically continue the time direction, okay? So this is your Euclidean uh, black hole solution. And so those are the solutions that have large entropy. Right, so this as a solution. This is this is a black. Typically, when you have a horizon, uh, well, actually, that's that's more or less uh, the only way how you can get um, uh, how you can get large entropies in the geometry is uh, when you have horizon, and over here um, the entropy is n to the zero. So those are uh, those are the phases, um, and and as you can see, there is a lot of them, and and there is a lot of phase transitions between them. Um, 
And just to highlight you, uh, you know, um, um, yeah, so, so this is like a picture of what would be water and ice. And, you know, there is a plot in my, uh, my paper that explains this. Now, um, what I wanna do, I actually, um, I, I, I see that I'm already uh, two minutes in my discussion session, um, so I don't have time. And so let me, let me just highlight for you uh, a very cool feature, something uh, that is incredibly unusual that happens when you study, um, when you study black holes uh, on these conifold, right, in this geometry. So luckily I explained, uh, I explained uh, um, uh, this already for you, uh, the five possible phases. Uh, what I'm gonna uh, focus on now, I'm focus on, uh, I'm gonna pick up uh, these uh, three phases, okay? Uh, why those three? Well, because I simplified my problem, right? So what I have done, I have taken, uh, okay, so let me be consistent at least here. Um, so what I have done, I have taken uh, the three sphere, right? So remember that um, uh, our gauge theory was living on the three sphere. And what I did, I decompactified it. Okay, so I took the radius of the three sphere and I let it go to infinity. And so I have R3. And so when you take this limit, uh, then out of five possible phases, uh, the only ones that will survive are actually the, um, the three phases that I mentioned here. And the reason is that the other two phases are associated with the shrinking of the three sphere. And you just, you know, you, you just don't do that. Alex? Okay. Yeah. You probably have uh, more than 10 minutes. We can have a little bit longer. Uh, yeah, you roughly have half an hour together with me. Oh, oh. <laughs> you, oh, I forgot. I for, you know, I forgot once. There was one, uh, one seminar with Arkady Weinstein and... Uh, um, uh, uh, and Misha Schiffman, and, and uh, it was forever, as I remember. At some stage, they didn't care about the speaker. They started talking themselves. No, but uh, uh, what, I what I wanted to suggest, yeah. maybe you should still f f uh, show some formula, like what's the answers for the black holes you're using, because it would be useful somehow to relate uh, uh, the pictures to some equations. Right, so I can do that, but you had, uh, a lot so, of, you had a lot of slides which you skipped. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so let me. Uh, 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 I actually don't have exactly the formula that Arkady is talking about, but uh, 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 let me mention something that uh, that that is similar. Okay. Uh, so I'll write the formulas. Um, I did write a lot of formulas, but not the ones that Arkady wants, so. Yeah, maybe not gauge theory. I was having in mind just maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I got it. So, sorry, it's a little bit slow. Um, so good. Um, so, so this is a metric ansatz. This would be the metric ansatz uh, that would correspond to, so, so, uh, so what I have skipped, I have skipped that, uh, the idea is that you start with um, uh, type to be uh, supergravity. And then what you do, uh, you derive the five dimensional effective action. Um, and, and, and the way you do it, uh, you basically uh, do a Kaluza Klein reduction on this, um, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, T11, uh, deformed T11 type of thing. And then you get an effective action. And so this effective action will depend on five dimensional metric, right? And then it will depend on a bunch of scalars, right? So there will be scalars omega one, omega two and omega three. And on top of that, there will be uh, three functions, H1, H2 and H3. I will mention what they are. And then finally, there will be uh, a dilaton, right? So, so as you remember in n equal four, uh, the dilaton was constant, we could forget about it. But over here, uh, basically um, you start with some uh, uh, 10 dimensional uh, type to be supergravity. Uh, and, and then you can consistently truncate it to the effective action involving the metric plus, plus seven scalar fields, okay? 
uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so the idea of a consistent truncation is that any solution, uh, any solution you can construct in five dimensions, you can uplift it. You can represent it as a solution of this um, uh, ten-dimensional supergravity. Okay, and so um, uh, so besides these fields, right? So your effective action depends on uh, three numbers. Okay, those are not fields; those are the numbers. Uh, one is the so-called M. Um, so it turns out that the gauge theory um, that uh, um, we are discussing, which I'm not, I'm just gonna write it down, um, but I'm not gonna explain it. It's one of the ranks is shifted, right? So it's a so-called quiver or moose gas gauge theory with one of the ranks shifted and that's parameter M. Then there is an asymptotic value of the dilaton and then there is one parameter which is a deformation of the conifer. Uh, so, so, um, so what I have uh, written over here, I have written a 10 dimensional metric on that, and you can see the scalar functions, omega one, omega two, and omega three. Uh, and, and so those functions, they are functions um, of the five dimensional, you know, five dimensional metric, right? So, so, so this um, five dimensional metric is G I J, right? As a function of Y dyi, dyj, okay? Um, and um, so, so, so over here, well, okay, maybe I can write it down as r, so this is some radial direction. And then what you see, you see this um, g1, uh, g2, and g5, uh, those are just some one forms, right? So, uh, so that's the angular part. That's the angular part on which you are doing your uh, Kaluza-Klein reduction, right? Uh, and um, so different phase, right? So, so, so I explained to you what is the metric and the three scalars. I told you that there is also a dilaton, right? So there is a non-trivial dilaton. And then what I did not explain yet is that um, there are these three functions, H1, H2, and H3. Uh, and uh, so those functions correspond to some fluxes, right? So in type 2B supergravity, what you have, you have a metric, a metric plus fluxes. I don't want to write down the exact form where the fluxes are, uh, because, um, you know, um, as far as it concerns what the black hole is, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't going to do much. Good. So, so when we talk about different phases, right? So what is happening? Well, so, so when I talk about different phases, I have to introduce an arbitrary function f of r here. Um, and um, yeah, so, so this omega one is already an arbitrary function. Uh, and then when I talk about the three sphere, right? So, so I have to replace this dxi, I have to replace it uh, with a metric on the three sphere. And then I need to introduce some different, um, uh, different wall function, okay? So, so what I'm saying is that a 10 dimensional metric DS10 squared uh, takes the following form. I have F uh, minus F DT squared plus G uh, DS3 squared. And then, uh, and then I have, if you wish, plus omega one. Okay, I, I actually, yeah, well, I can uh, leave it like this, dr squared plus g5 squared and plus the rest, okay? So, so, um, so different phases. So, so now once I have this metric ansatz, right? So in general, when I have this consistent um, uh, Kaluza-Klein reduction, so all my scalars and my metric, it can be function of, you know, of arbitrary manifold M4, right? So when I study my cascading um, gauge theory on S3, then I make a specific choice that my background gauge theory manifold is a three sphere uh, times um, the time, basically time direction. Uh, and, and so now, once I have this effective action, I can derive the equations of motion, right? And so when I look at different phases, I look for black hole solution or whatnot, uh, then um, these functions are functions of the radial coordinate, right? 
and then this functions omega i as a function of the radial coordinate. And then I have my flux function, they also function of the radial. And finally, is the dilaton as well. Okay. So I can derive this equation of motion just in a standard way, how you derive equation of motion from the effective action. And then you need to solve it, but you need to solve it with a different boundary conditions, right? And so boundary condition, for example, if you have a boundary condition when F goes um, uh, to zero as uh, R goes to zero, uh, then what you have is what we discussed before as a deconfined phase. You can find faces or you have black hole solutions, right? So this is a solution where uh, there is a location in a radial co coordinate where the GTT component of the metric uh, goes to zero. That's your black hole. So that's, uh, that's one way how you, you know, how you specify what are the phases. So a different topologically distinct boundary condition is that you actually require that this G function goes to zero at some radial coordinate. And so you see what is happening is that in this case, it's a spatial three sphere that shrinks to zero size. So this is some of these confining phases that I was discussing. Finally, uh, finally, um, you can have a, a boundary conditions where one of those omega i's uh, will shrink to zero size, okay? You cannot, uh, it's not true that you can pick up whatever omega i you want and you can impose boundary conditions that somewhere it goes to zero. That's an inconsistent. So when you do this analysis, when you ask the questions, what are the possible phases? Um, what are the black holes? What are the confining phases? Um, you basically have to analyze what is a consistent set of boundary conditions. And a consistent set of boundary condition means that whenever you have uh, uh, some submanifold of your background geometry shrinking to zero size, uh, then uh, it should shrink to zero size without producing curvature singularities. And so it is exactly this type of analysis that led to uh, five different um, uh, deconfined, uh, five, five different thermal phases of the cascading gauge series that I was mentioning. So Arkady, is this uh, fair enough? Is this uh, reasonable? Yes, now it's better. Yeah, now I understand more and better. Yeah. Right. So, so basically, the idea is that you get this uh, complicated effective action, and 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 then there are different cycles in in uh, you know uh, that that arise when you uplift it, and and so it's the same equations of motions that uh, are for all phases, and the only difference are the boundary conditions. Okay, that you fully analyze. All right, so if there are no questions, let me actually mention something that comes up. Right, so, so, so that's why I'm saying is that it's, it's fairly technical. It's a, straightforward, uh, uh, it's a straightforward computation, but it is technically involved uh, and it has to be done numerically. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately you can solve, um, uh, these equations uh, have to be solved numerically and, uh, uh, and, and there are lots of numerical issues what's going on. Okay, so, so let me mention something that comes up to be uh, very interesting that I think uh, when you do, right. So, um, so after, uh, after you construct these equations of motion, right? Equations of motion, uh, you impose boundary conditions and then you numerically solve them. Um, there are more steps that you need to do. So you need to extract, you need to extract uh, the, uh, the quantities like the energy density, the entropy density, and the free energy density, right? And for example, the temperature. Uh, and, and, and the reason why this is a non-trivial thing, well, so, so why would you want to do it, right? So you construct, you know, uh, you constructed these solutions uh, numerically, but so what, right? So, so now actually this is what, uh, where the physics starts, right? So, so, um, so the physics starts is exactly 
when you want to figure it out, uh, if I have fixed temperature, do I have ice or do I have water, right? So you want to identify which phase is the dominant one. And so uh, for that is exactly uh, why I said you need to extract these uh, thermodynamic parameters. And the problem is uh, that, uh, as you know, if you would be computing something in quantum field theory, you will get divergences. And so, um, so similar things happens in, uh, uh, in ADS-CFT correspondence. Once you start extracting um, what would be a, uh, in, in, um, in the, for the black hole and the conifold, you want to compute what the mass density of this black hole or the mass of this black hole if it's um, on the three sphere. And you will find out the divergent answer. Uh, and these divergent answers, and these divergent expressions are simply exactly uh, what you have in quantum field theory. Um, because of the quantum effects, um, um, you know, there will be a renormalization of the bare quantities. Uh, and and so, so over here, when I say extract, uh, what you need to do, you need to perform the holographic, um, holographic um, renormalization, right? So in a nutshell, um, it's kind of similar type of analysis, uh, what you do in, uh, um, in quantum field theory. And you establish that, for example, some of the quantum field series are renormalizable and the other quantum field series are not renormalizable. And, and so, uh, so in a paper uh, some time ago with uh, um, Amos Yarom and uh, um, Ofa Akharoni, uh, we actually initiated the idea of this holographic renormalization. So these theories, they're very interesting theories. As you go to um, arbitrary high energies, it looks like that uh, the rank of the gauge group grows to infinity. And so it's not even clear whether this theory makes sense um, as a renormalizable four dimensional field theory. And so what we have proven, uh, we have proven um, that yes, indeed, uh, you can renormalize this model. And, uh, uh, in, in the work that I'm explaining right now, uh, I would have to extend the ideas of the uh, holographic renormalization just simply because uh, the model is more complicated. I have more scalars. And once you have more scalars, uh, um, you know, it's just technically, you, you more or less have to repeat uh, um, the renormalization. It's exactly the same thing as if you would be doing in uh, uh, field theory. Uh, if you, uh, Adding additional um, scalars uh, to the model, as I was explaining, I have seven of them. It's exactly the same thing as if you add additional couplings uh, to your quantum field theory. And then once you have couplings, for each coupling, you have to check whether or not the renormalization is going to be spoiled or not. And that's exactly uh, what exactly what you do. So, so you start with the equations of motion, then you numerically solve, uh, then you do this holographic renormalization, and then you get your answers, right? You get your answers, what is the mass of the black hole and all other properties. Um, and what is remarkable that this idea of holographic renormalization, you can uh, renormalize this theory on arbitrary M4. Okay, I wanna mention this because uh, it's an important thing. It tells you it's not just kind of one trick pony. You can play very interesting game here. So you can take this model and you can say that um, this M4 is um, uh, uh, F, FLRW universe, right? And that would allow you to start as this confining gauge theory in expanding universe. All right, so what I wanna do now, um, so I explained to you how you construct these solutions, uh, at least not, but, you know, sort of the idea that it's possible to do it roughly. Uh, and so what I want to do, I want to uh, show you what came up as the answer, right? Um, so, um, so as I was saying, um, so I will try to finish in five minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so what I will uh, try to do, I will take the L3 and I will decompactify, right? So what we will do, we will study cascading gauge theory on R3 comma one. And so instead of a black holes, uh, what we will be studying, we will be studying black brains. Okay. 
Uh, and um, so as you can see, so in this case, uh, when you analyze consistent uh, boundary conditions, uh, there are these three phases. Uh, and so, so this phase that uh, Arkady is very familiar about, uh, so this is uh, Klebanov, uh, Klebanov Zetling black hole. Well, more precisely, black, I will use the word black hole, um, but it's black brain. Um, so this is the one that a lot of people were looking for. It. So this is a phase uh, where, um, uh, which uh, you can call as a, a Klebanov, Klebanov Strassler black hole. So in this case, what you have, you have deconfined theory and you have a U1 symmetry, right? So your space is more symmetric. And so when you, when I'm talking about this phase, so this is the so-called klebanov strassler black hole. Okay. And in this klebanov strassler black hole, you actually have, uh, you actually have um, uh, only a Z2 symmetry. So, so this is a black hole on deformed conifer. Uh, and 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 uh, uh, and and so so this this is this is a black hole on the uh, you can think of on a singular conifer. I didn't have time to explain what that is. Singular conifer. So so Arcadi, we did uh, we did some early work with Arcadi on this um, on this phase, um, and in particular we started it uh, when the temperature was much larger than the strong coupling scale of the theory. Uh, however, this phase was absolutely unknown. So those are the two deconfined phases. Um, and, then, and then there is this confined phase, okay? And so this confined phase is actually a very simple phase. So what you do, you take um, klebanov strassler vacuum solution, uh, and then you simply, uh, um, you, you simply uh, make it Euclidean, right? And, and, and you periodically identify um, the time direction, right? So this is, this is our time direction. It never shrinks to zero size. And so this phase is exactly what we spend quite a lot of time. This is exactly um, as, uh, uh, as it would have been uh, um, uh, so this would have been confined, uh, confined n equal four phase, phase on S three, right? So, so the only difference is that in that case it was the S three that was shrinking to zero size, and so in this case the confined phase is that S two, and so this S two, which is part of this uh, coset T one one, that is shrinking to zero size. Okay, so this is very simple solution. So in this case, um, um, you can compute that the energy density is equal to zero, the entropy is equal to zero. Again, more precisely, um, what I mean is that uh, um, uh, you can think of this that this divided by sort of n squared. Okay, uh, and in some sense, that's that's already a check on the holographic renormalization. You know that um, the energy density must be zero because that's a supersymmetric solution, right? And in a supersymmetric solution, well, you it's a good idea if your uh, renormalization um, establishes that the vacuum energy has uh, uh, has uh, uh, zero energy. Okay, so uh, are there any questions? Did I explain uh, the three phases? Um, the three phases in the um, uh, in the case when uh, I have R three and not um, um, not S three on the conifer. No. Okay, very good. So let me show you. Let me show you how the phase diagram looks like. Okay, so uh, so there are three phases, and you can see here three lines. And so what I'm plotting, uh, what I'm plotting on one of the axes, I plot, um, I plot the ratio of temperature over the strong coupling scale. And so going in this direction is uh, increasing the temperature, right? So temperature goes up. Uh, and, 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 and so the work that we did with Arcadi, right? So, so it's basically somewhere down here. So that's a branch of the Klebanov, uh, um, uh, Klebanov-Zetling uh, black holes. So it's all over here. 
Uh, and, and so this is this green line, uh, the green line, this is a confined solution. And so what I'm plotting uh, on the vertical axis, that's a free energy, which is negative pressure. Uh, and, and so the phase that is a dominant one uh, is the one that has lower free energy. And so what you see, uh, so this is a work, um, so this is a work that was done uh, more than 10 years ago with uh, Ofa Haroni and Patrick Kerner. Um, so, so what you see, you see this phase transition. So there is a critical temperature. And so this is a critical temperature when uh, if I am in this regime, uh, then the confined phase, the green line has a lower free energy. And so it's a dominant one. And so over here, uh, so on the other hand, over here, it's a Klebanov, uh, Klebanov settling black hole that dominates, okay? And so this point over here, this is your first order, first order um, confinement, deconfinement uh, phase transition. So this is similar to the confinement. Well, I mean, it's on one hand, it's similar and very different confinement, deconfinement phase transition in N equal four, because I am emphasizing that in this case, I am not compactifying uh, the spatial directions of my gauge theory. So this is a genuine confinement, okay? This is uh, sometimes when people talk about confinement of N equal four and S3, they use the word um, uh, uh, kinematic confinement. It's basically confinement because you put uh, the theory uh, on a finite volume space. Here, I have a confinement deconfinement in an infinite volume. So, uh, so now when I am moving along this uh, uh, line of klebanov settling black holes, um, so you can think of is that um, I am in a super cooled, um, so let me write it down. Um, super cooled uh, water phase, okay? So however, uh, 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 however, in order for me to get to ice, right? So, so this over here, it's ice. In order for me to get to ice, uh, it has to be a first order phase transition. And first order phase transition in large end models, uh, uh, they are suppressed basically because the bubble nucleation has a barrier height and this barrier height will typically grow uh, with M. And, 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 and so this klebanov um, klebanov settling solution, this blue line uh, is perfect, you know, it's, um, it's perfectly fine to, um, uh, um, to extend it uh, way past this transition. And so I'm following it. And so what you will discover, you will discover, so this is confinement, deconfinement transition, as I said, uh, confinement, deconfinement. And then you will discover that there is a different critical point, okay? And so, um, so all over this line, uh, there is a symmetry of the solution, which is U1, that's your chiral symmetry. And even though the solution is symmetric, what you can do, you can study fluctuations that break uh, the symmetry uh, to a Z2, okay? Um, and uh, so, so what you are finding, you are finding that these fluctuations are stable here, stable here. Stable, what I mean is that uh, if you excite those fluctuations, what would happen is that the system will relax to a thermal equilibrium and all these fluctuations will vanish, okay? So there will be some characteristic dissipation set by basically temperature and all those fluctuations will decay. However, uh, there is this critical temperature, uh, I call it temperature of the chiral, chiral symmetry breaking, Again, uh, this is happening um, from the studies of klebanov settling black holes, right? So remember that, uh, for example, Arkady was looking at it when the temperature was very high. So this is the type of the part of the space diagram uh, which was hidden in the old studies. And so uh, if you cross, what happens is that once you cross this temperature, then uh, these fluctuations will become unstable. So chiral symmetry uh, breaking fluctuations are unstable. 
and uh, and and so so what happens uh, uh, what happens is that if you have an excite if you excited uh, this fluctuation they will grow okay in a linearized approximation their amplitude will grow without any bounds so um, so now comes a very interesting part because this is very what what I will tell next is very counterintuitive. Um, so, so remember that uh, the fluctuations, um, what the fluctuations are doing, right? So they are breaking um, the U1 symmetry all the way to Z2. So you can uh, think about um, another way of thinking about, now, now I'm focusing on this transition, another way of thinking of, uh, think about uh, Ising model. And so, uh, so in the Ising model, uh, uh, as, as you know, uh, there is also a critical temperature. Um, uh, and, and that's a, a temperature that distinguishes order versus uh, a disorder. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and, and so at high temperature, uh, you have, uh, um, you know, you have a, a, the spins can point uh, pretty much at random, right, up or down. Uh, and then when you cross this critical temperature, um, then the order uh, will arise, right? So there is a, um, um, uh, there is a preferred direction, right? Um, and, and so you can use, for example, uh, spontaneous magnetization as the order parameter uh, for this uh, symmetry breaking. And so whenever this happens, uh, there is a new phase, right? So, so uh, what, what, what would you expect? Uh, you would actually expect if it would be an Ising model. So there is this line. So there is a critical point. And after the critical point, uh, there, is, um, there is a phase. So, uh, so the temperature goes in this direction. Uh, so, so there is a, um, at low temperatures, there is less symmetric phase, right? So what we expect, we expect that if there is any spontaneous symmetry breaking, then the symmetry is being restored uh, as you heat up the system. Or in other words, the, uh, the uh, ordered phase, right? The phase with the uh, order parameter exists at low temperatures. Right, so the ordered phase of the Ising model exists at low temperatures, and so over here, what you find, you find a very, very interesting and different picture. So exactly at this point uh, where um, chiral symmetry breaking fluctuations become unstable, you do have a new phase of black holes that joins in, and those are the Klebanov, Klebanov Strassle, uh, Strassle black hole. Right, so those are the black holes that for like 20 years people tried, uh, so it's uh, those black holes that people tried to find um, and they couldn't. However, notice what happens is that uh, while in Ising model, um, the, the phase with the broken symmetry exists at uh, low temperatures. What happens is that in this case, this klebanov strassler black hole actually exists at higher temperatures. And uh, so, so, so that's a very unusual phenomena. This is what um, uh, people studied uh, uh, recently. It's known as, uh, um, you know, um, uh, order at infinitely high temperatures. And so one way where you see this order at high temperatures is in this uh, klebanov um, strassler black hole. Um, good, so- um, Alex. Maybe we yep. should wrap up. Yeah, could you? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm wrapping up, um, uh, and uh, uh, so let me conclude. Um, and uh, um, and just there are a couple couple minutes for questions if people have. Uh, is that uh, so? I presented you a picture of uh, well, at least give you a, an idea what are the possible black holes and black brains on the carnival, how you can study it. Um, so, so it has implications for the string landscape and swamp land. Uh, so what's still an open question is to understand the stability of various solutions uh, that I constructed. Um, and a, a, another interesting uh, question that I alluded to is to try to follow, uh, try to follow this uh, klebanov strassler black hole and ask the question, uh, um, uh, do these exist at infinitely high temperature? What happens with them? And so that would be an example of the conformal order, something that uh, people are looking uh, right now. And uh, so I am referring to the papers by Zohar Komargovsky and company 
uh, and so far there is no example uh, in string theory. All right, I'm sorry I ran over time, but thank you for your for you know thank you for the patience. Well, thank, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, are there any questions? So you think this uh, the lessons are kind of broader than this particular setup? Um, you, I, you, I think it's very interesting. For example, um, uh, there are still un, uh, unknown phases that can happen. So I um, this klebanov strassler black holes, they, um, they do not dominate in a canonical ensemble. But in microcanonical ensemble, so this is this plot, you can see that they dominate. Uh, and, and so it's an interesting, so if I were to do simulations, then I would see a really dynamical transition between klebanov uh, Zetling and klebanov uh, uh, Strassler black holes. The reason why I mentioned it's broader towards, uh, um, uh, towards string swamp land, uh, because it relates to the ideas of you know, there was this old GAPSA criteria about good, bad singularities, right? Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and so the, according to that criteria, if you have a good singularity, you can uh, cloak it with a horizon. Why this is related to a, a landscape is because in these DCETA constructions, you basically have a negative D3 brain charge. And so the question that you can ask, uh, is it possible to construct is a klebanov settling or klebanov strassler black hole where when I measure, uh, so this uh, three form, uh, sorry, the five form flux, it varies. But if I measure it at the horizon, uh, can I get a negative value of that? And if you could do that, that would be an indication that, you know, at least this, uh, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, whatever the uh, singularity cloaked behind the horizon can have a negative D3 brain charge. And so that would say that, say, anti-D3 brains on the conifold are consistent. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot do it. So if you, you can look at all the black holes that you construct, and you will always find that uh, uh, the, uh, the charge of, uh, um, uh, of the horizon is always either zero or positive. It's never negative. So, uh, um, so that's an application towards the, uh, the swamp land. And then there is an application of how, how does confinement, deconfinement happens in, the, in this theater? I think it's, it's an interesting question. So that's, uh, um, there is a lot to do. I have a question. Yep. So um, I, I don't know. So in, in ALIS uh, five times S5, um, uh, you know, there's another limit. Uh, usually, we call this as the attentionless limit. And uh, in in, uh, in a dual uh, field set aside, uh, there is also some uh, uh, is is a free uh, CPMU series, and there are some also has some um, this uh, so called this confined and uh, deconfined phase transition. Uh, uh, I wonder in in in, in, your, in your, uh, setting up in this um, uh, type to be on this calling for the while. Uh, it, it also happens here. Right, so, so, uh, um, so I guess what you are referring to is, uh, um, you know, okay, so when you, when you talk about tensionless string limit, right, so this is, um, uh, this is a limit in which, uh, um, uh, uh, in which the supergravity approximation will not be valid anymore. And, uh, uh, and so you would have to use some techniques. Um, uh, Honestly, you know, we don't have we don't have machinery to answer questions like this, even in uh, you know in uh, simpler examples. So the only thing is that the conifold is more complicated, um, more complicated story. So you can uh, you can push yourself into the tensionless uh, uh, string limit, but then what it will tell you, it will tell you that besides the supergravity, you have to uh, add to your effective action basically condensate of strings. And that's a, you know, we don't even know how to do it in a, in simpler settings, so. Yes, uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, uh, um, uh, but in this, I guess, in the field, in the field, uh, server side, there is also a free limit, right? Um, well, okay, so that's a funny story, right? So I didn't have time to explain about this cascading gauge theory, right? So, so, um, uh, so there is a huge difference in this theory compared to super young males. 
So what happens in super young meals, there is a so-called uh, exactly marginal coupling, right? The young meals couplings that you can change uh, and uh, you can go to weak coupling or you can go to strong coupling, right? Now, um, now in this model, um, in this model, there is no, uh, there is no um, exactly marginal coupling. Uh, exactly um, marginal yeah. coupling. So, so, so what this means, this means that you cannot go uh, to weak coupling, strictly speaking. Uh, and some of the slides that, uh, 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 that I uh, skipped, so I, I'm happy to actually email slides to, um, uh, to Dmitry later. Uh, you can look at the slides. What happens is that uh, this theory is very strange. Um, so if you look from the field theory perspective, uh, it exists, uh, so there is some energy scale, uh, and it just so happens that this theory, uh, if you think of it just from the field theory perspective, exists only in a certain um, in a certain range, and there are there is a Landau pole in the infrared of this theory, and there is a Landau pole in the ultraviolet, right? So this is a very unusual situation. Normally, you either have, when you talk about confining theories, you either have a Landau pole. Um, so if the theory is confining and say asymptotically free, then you have uh, a Landau pole in the infrared. And if the theory is uh, uh, an abelian, like, like an abelian uh, um, gauge theory, um, then, then this, this theory has a Landau pole in the ultraviolet. So, um, so, but in, in the two examples, either it's asymptotically free or infrared free, you can go to some energy scales and you, know, you get basically weak coupling. This model is never weak coupling. You start at some energy scale and either you go to lower scales or to the higher scales, this, this theory will always remain strongly coupled. So in some sense, in some sense, even though this is a four dimensional field theory, but this field theory, what I would say, has a, um, uh, has a correct definition in terms of this gravitational background of the conifer. OK. OK, Sorry. thanks. Yep. Yep, thanks. Any other questions? OK, good. Uh, so since right. we don't have any other questions, so let's thank the speaker. Thank right. you. Thank you so much. Arkady, um, очень приятно было вас видеть. <laughs> Держитесь. Мы живем как. In any case, we'll have a record and probably slides of the talk. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I will be happy. I will email Dmitry slides right away. Yeah. Thank be... you so much, and thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Bye bye.